a privilege to be with you this morning. <clears throat> I did get to speak to your pastor, Scott, last week and uh, got an update on him and Pam, so I'd like to just open with prayer for them. I know you're praying for them regularly, but can we do that together? Father, we just bow our hearts and our heads for a moment. Think of Scott, uh, hopefully resting and relaxing a little bit up in the mountains. We pray for Pam at home, uh, recovering, and we pray, Father, for your healing touch on her. It's been a tough road, a long road, and we just ask you for your divine intervention. We know in your word you healed many, and we know also we don't deserve any special treatment, but we ask because you say we could ask in your name. So we do pray for healing for Pam, and we pray for rest and renewal for Scott as they fight this battle. You said on earth we would have trial and tribulation. They have and we have. And so we as a church family lift them up to you and ask you to touch their hearts and touch their lives as they walk through this and that this church continues to walk together with them. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Amen, thank you. <clears throat> We're in a movie theater, right? So how many of you remember the movie A Few Good Men? Jack Nicholson, Tom Cruise, and what was the famous line in that movie? Yeah, I can't hear you. Say it again. Say it like he said it. Yeah, you can't handle the truth. You remember that? Well, today that's not the question. The question is you can't find the truth. It doesn't matter to me whether you watch Fox News or CNN. Do you think you're getting truth from the media today? What about schools? Do you think as our kids go back to school this week or next, they're going to get truth in their schools? How about business? We go to business. You see advertisements on television, radio. Are we getting the truth from the business community? How about government? Is government providing us truth, whether it's city, county, state, federal government? And how about the church? You think people that are sitting in churches today all over the city of Denver are getting the truth? I don't know when truth left the public square, but I think it's very difficult today to find truth. What about Christians? What about us? How are we doing with truth? By the way, my message is called Truth. George Barna does a study, a lot of studies about Christianity. <clears throat> Here was one of their recent studies. Being a Christian or associating with the Christian faith is not as attractive to Americans as it used to be. Besides the battering Christians take in the media, another reason it is, is it's relatively rare to find someone who exemplifies the truth. Most self-identified Christians are comfortable with the idea that the Bible and sacred books from non-Christian religions all teach the same truths and principles. Faith in America is now individual and customized. We are comfortable with the idea of being spiritual as opposed to devoutly Christian. We become our own unchallenged spiritual authorities, defining truth and reality as we see fit. Only 34% of adults believe in absolute moral truth. The study continues, and I think these are the reasons for those trends that I just described. The study goes on to say biblical literacy is neither a current reality nor a goal in the United States. Little, if any, progress is being made toward assisting people to become more biblically literate. Bible reading has become the religious equivalent of soundbite journalism. When people read from the Bible, they typically open it, read a brief passage without much regard to its context. If they're comfortable with it, they accept it. Otherwise, they deem it interesting but irrelevant to their life and move on. About half of self-identified Christians firmly believe that the Bible is totally accurate in all the principles it teaches. About half of self-identified Christians believe that. 
that the Bible is even true. The study concludes with this statement. We cannot really call the faith of American Christians a Bible-based faith. Christians today have accepted and combined so many ideas from other worldviews and religions that they have created their own faith system. Wow. Are we there? Self-identified Christians are saying these things. I believe the challenge our nation faces and our church faces is because of the neglect of God's word. In Hosea chapter 4, verse 1, the Bible says, Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, for the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. And then verse 6 goes on to say, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge because you have forgotten the law of your God. Are we there? Is that what it's like today across our nation, across our city? Statistics a while back said that less than 10% of the city of Denver, surrounding areas, are even in a house of worship today. We've forgotten the Bible, haven't we? We've forgotten the Word. But it's not the first time in history. This process repeats itself over and over. So grab your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 22. 2 Kings chapter 22. Let's go back in a day when the children of Israel lost their way. They too stopped reading and obeying the truth of God's word. 2 Kings 22, and if you'd stand in honor of God's word, I think some of these passages will be on the screen for you. 2 Kings 22, starting with verse 1, as you stand in honor of God's word. Verse 1, Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. They were rebuilding the temple in the Jerusalem, and then go down to verse 8. The high priest found the book of the law in the house of the Lord, and they read, they read it before King Josiah. And then verse 11 through 13. Now it happened, when the king heard the words of the book of the law, that he tore his clothes. Go, inquire of the Lord for me, for the people and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us. Because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. And then verse 16. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring calamity on this place and on its inhabitants. All the words of the book which, are, which the king of Judah has read because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath shall be aroused against this place and shall not be quenched. But as for the king of Judah, that's Josiah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, in this manner you shall speak to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which you have heard, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place, and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse, and you tore your clothes and wept before me. I also have heard you, says the Lord. Surely, therefore, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I will bring on this place. And then go down to chapter 23, verse 3. Here is Josiah's response to what he just heard from the Lord. Then the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people took a stand for the covenant. Thank you for standing in honor of God's word. You can be seated. I think God is searching for Josiah's today. Those who will read their Bibles and obey what it says. 
And it was no easier for Josiah to do it than we think it would be for us today. He faced tremendous obstacles, which we're going to learn about here as we walk through this passage. And we think we do too. We think we could, how hard it would be for us today to be biblical Christians in our culture, our families, at work. It was no different for Josiah. He faced those obstacles, but he heard the word of the Lord he sold out to God in his word, and he decided to act accordingly, regardless of the price. So we'll return to that text in a few minutes to see what bold ste steps that Josiah took. But first, let's talk about this word truth. Let's take a moment and see what the Bible says about truth. It doesn't matter what I think, what you think. It's a matter of what the word of God says about truth. Where do we find truth? What happens when we're truthless? And what happens when we're truthful? And so let's go through eight scriptures very quickly on those topics, two verses each, on just the concept of truth. I think we'd agree we need truth in our world today, don't we? We need it in our homes. We need it in our families. We need it in our society. So let's think about some verses we can use to deal with this issue of truth with those around us. So the first two verses are, where is truth found? John 14, 6, you probably can quote it with me. Jesus speaking, though, saying, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So the truth is found in Jesus, amen? Amen. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So truth is found in God's word. Amen? Amen? So when we ignore Jesus, we ignore truth. When we deny the Holy Spirit, we deny the truth. And when we avoid God's word, we avoid truth. So no wonder the world is truthless today. How many people care about Jesus? How many people read the Bible? So society all around us is truthless. So let's talk about truthless. The next two verses are on truthless. Romans 2.8. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. Isaiah 59.14. says, Justice is turned back, and righteousness stands far away, for truth has stumbled in the public squares. So truthlessness results in wrath, fury, unrighteousness, and lies. Is that what we see all around us today? The next two are on the pursuit of truth. Okay, that's the condition we're in. What do we do? How do we pursue truth? 2 Corinthians 4, 2 tell us, but we have renounced disgraceful and underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And 2 Timothy 2, 15 tells us, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed rightly handling the word of truth. Can we do that as Christians today? Can we rightly handle the word of truth with those around us that don't believe it, that don't buy it? So to pursue truth, we need to renounce disgraceful, underhanded ways. We need to refuse to tamper with God's word. We need to seek the Lord. We need to present ourselves to him. And we need to be able to rightly handle the word of truth. And the last two are on the benefits of truth. And I was coached after the first service to add a verse, so I'm going to add it here. Not just John 8.32, but John 8.31 and 32. So John 8.31 says the benefits of truth. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word... You are truly my disciples, and then verse 32, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Yeah, 
So we can know the truth. That's the benefit of, of pursuing truth. We can know the truth and the, the truth can set us free. How many of us need to be set free? How many of people in your family need to be set free? How many people in our society need to be set free? And where are they going to get set free? From truth. And we know because we know where the truth is that if they can know the truth, the truth can set them free. Zechariah 8.16 says, These are the things that you shall do. Speak the truth to one another. Render in your gates judgments that are true and make for peace. So the benefits of truth are freedom, delight, wisdom, good judgment, and peace. Those are the things we want in our homes, our families, our community, right? Those are the benefits of truth. So we live in a sense of a truthless society. Who's going to bring us back to truth? Politicians or the church? Are we going to bring people back to truth? So where is the most reliable place to find truth in our society today? How about right here, right? So I'll give, me, give you an acronym for Bible, B-I-B-L-E. Basic instructions before life every day. Maybe you can share that with some people that are struggling. Maybe you'd like to have some instructions from God, basic instructions before life every day. The Bible is what can help them. 66 books written by 40 different authors over 1,600 years, 1,189 chapters, 31,102 verses. Yet, the whole thing can be read in the speed that I'm speaking in 72 hours. That's a long weekend. And yet we know that as Christians, we struggle, most of us, with Bible reading. Among Bible readers, the average total time per week in the Bible is 52 minutes. That's 7.4 minutes a day. Now, I can hardly see you because of these bright lights, but I don't know if you're above average or below average here. 7.4 minutes a day in the Word of God. Yet, how much time do you think people spend in front of a television? Three hours a day. So, where are we getting our truth? From TV or from the Word of God? Surveys tell us we don't read the Bible. In America, in the church. So, I've done this for 20 years now, and I like to do a survey. So would you stand? Can you stand up with me? It's hard for me to see you, but stand up, and I'm going to ask you three questions. And then as I ask the questions, you sit down when the question applies to you. So everybody can play here. Everybody stands. And the first question, when it, if it applies to you, you sit down. First question is, I have not read my Bible at all since last Sunday. Please be seated. Okay, the next question is, I've read my Bible some three or four times, but not every day since last Sunday, and then you could be seated. And the next question is, I've read my Bible every day since last Sunday, and you can be seated. So do I do that to embarrass you? No. I do that to remind us that we are the statistics. The statistics tell us that about 16% of people read the Bible every day. I'd say in a Calvary chapel, it's always more than that. But in many churches I go to, it's not more than that. So praise God, I know you come here because you're Bible-believing people. But there's better, more we can do here, right? We can all be standing and saying, I read the Bible every day. So back to the Bible, an organization out of Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, works on this a lot. They do surveys. They do a lot of research. I got to go there, and down one side of the hallway, they have all the reasons people say they don't read the Bible. And then on the other side, they have all the reasons that people say they want to read the Bible. So let me see if any of these touch you as to why we struggle with Bible reading. Of their 50 reasons about why people don't read the Bible, here's a few. Let's see if these apply to you. I'm overextended. What does that mean? I'm too busy. How many of you would say you're too busy to read the Bible? And then bad time management. It's kind of the same. We say that God is the highest priority in our lives, but somehow we can't fit him in to our daily routine with some time with daily Bible reading and prayer. The third one is my own laziness. 
I just don't get around to it. I like this one a lot. Church-related activities. I'm too busy doing stuff in my church. I don't have time to read the Bible. That wouldn't apply to any of you, would it? Another one is lack of a meaningful plan. Okay, I get that one. A lot of people start. They just open the Bible. They stop. They don't know where to go. They don't know what to do. So I'll give you some ideas for a meaningful plan a little bit later in this message. But their research also comes up with something very interesting. And that's that it takes at least four times a week to be in the Word of God before it will change your life. So if you're, you know, one or two times, it's probably not impacting you much. So they figured out the threshold seems to be at least four days a week before it begins to impact our lives, spending time in God's Word. So why read the Bible? Now, I've said I've given these messages for 20 years, and I've heard people give me these answers, and maybe these are answers for you. One is to know God better. How many of us would like to know God better? I think almost all Christians would say, I want to know God better. So how do we do that? John 5, 39 tells us in the scriptures, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. So if we want to know God better, we search the scriptures because it's all about him. Another reason that people say they want to read the Bible is to learn how to live life, live like God wants me to live. So I think a lot of us would say that too, right? We want to live the way God wants us to live, and how do we figure that out? We figure that out by reading the scriptures. So in Proverbs 4, 20 through 22, the word says, O oh, my son, give attention to my words. Incline your ears to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. So yeah, from the Bible, we can figure out how God wants me to live because it's his instruction manual and how to live. And another reason people say they want to read the Bible is to find answers to problems I have in my life. Now, this is my first time here. I don't know any of you. Or I don't think I do. So I don't know whether you have problems in your life or not. But I could probably guess that some of you, maybe most of you, have some challenges. So what do we do with that? How do we deal with the challenges in our life? Psalm 119, 130 tells us, the entrance of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Now, I think I'm simple. When I grew up in my home, we were not allowed to read the Bible because we were not priests. We were not educated. We didn't have a formal education, so we had to be taught the scriptures from a pulpit like this. Later in my life, I decided I could read this on my own. I said as a 15-year-old, I was in an accident, I started reading the Bible. I'm a simple guy. But God can unveil his truth to all of us through the word. So we can find the answers to the problems of our life, whether we have a Bible education or not, by spending time in God's word. I know it's worked for me, and I'm sure it's worked for many of you as well. All the answers we need, I believe, are in this book. I call it the owner's manual. God made us. He gave us an instruction book as to how to live life. And all the answers are right here. But somehow we just can't find time to spend in it. So maybe you're convinced. I hope that if you're confused about life, if you want real answers, give the truth of the word of God a chance in your life. He loves you. He wants a truthful relationship with all of us. He has so much to show us. And he chose to put his thoughts, his truth, his instructions in one book. How many of you are old enough to remember the Encyclopedia Britannica? How many volumes, like 24 volumes of the wisdom of men? He got everything we need in one volume. That's amazing. That's worth reading for me. So how? Let me talk about methods, how? Research tells us, as we already shared, you need a plan. So let me give you some ideas, some tools. We have a table out back. 
the, all the tools we have just tries to connect God's people to God's word as easy as we can. So everything we have out there will help you. So one thing you could do is download a free app called Ad Bible, ADD Bible, all caps, get a card out there if you want, and you can listen to the word of God every day, 10 minute devotion, a chapter of scripture, some comments from me, and applications as to how it applies to your life. We're in the book of Matthew right now, so if you wanna do that, that's an easy thing to do, just listen every day for 10 minutes. Another thing is we have these resources, we have Bible reading journals, we have one here, we have another one out there. These have reading plans in them. So you just follow the plan that's in the journal. And then I've done this for 35 years, write down what I'm hearing from the Lord. And so you write a verse, you write down what God is saying. So you journal your way through the Bible. Awesome. It'll change the way you read the Bible. And then we have resources called Day by Day Through the Bible. There's four books out there. And so if you want, like this one is the writings of Solomon. There's 53 days, one chapter a day, you listen, and you just write down your own thoughts. There's the writings of the minor prophets, take you 79 days. The writings of John, 58 days. And the writings of Paul, 87 days. If you were to get all four of those, that would be nine months of daily Bible reading that will help you stay in the scriptures, learn more about God, solve the problems of your life, and help you understand how God wants us to live. The personal um, journals that I've used, and they're incorporated in these books, resources that give you the chance to spend time in God's word. Now let's go back to the text. Put your finger back in 2 Kings chapter 23. Let's go back and find out how hearing the word of the Lord touched Josiah, and hopefully how it will touch us now. So we learn from what Josiah did, we apply it to what we can do as we spend time in God's word. So 2 Kings chapter 23, verse, verses verse 4. The first thing Josiah did in his day was eliminate idols from the temple. In other words, he took the idols out of the church. And the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, the priests of the second order, and the doorkeepers to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the articles that were made for Baal, for Asherah, and for all the host of heaven. And he burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried their ashes to Bethel. He took it serious, what he heard from the Lord, and he wiped out the idols in the temple. So the question for us is, what idols have crept into your life? Work, entertainment, selfish ambition, sports, shopping, listening to the voices of men rather than the voices of God, the voice of God, what needs to be eliminated so you can get back to pursuing truth. The second thing he did is in verse five, he removed the idolatrous priests. So first he took out the idols. The next thing he did is take out the false priests. Verse says, then he removed the idolatrous priests whom the king of Judah had ordained to burn incense on the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places all around Jerusalem. And those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun, to the moon, to the constellations, and to all the host of heaven. So first he started in the church, in the temple. And then he began to move out across the city, removing the false priests. Question for us then is, where are your eyes? Are they on the things of the world rather than the things of the word? What distractions need to be removed so you can clearly seek and find the truth again in your life? Next thing he did was in verses 10 through 16, he destroyed the high places, the altars, the wooden images, and the sacred pillars to the false gods of the neighboring nations. So temple, priests, and now he's out in the countryside taking down all the altars. Question for us, what worldly influences have infiltrated your Christian life? TV, music, video games, movies, the internet, what needs to be controlled or even destroyed so you can have time again for unhurried, uninterrupted Bible reading and prayer? 
And then the last thing he did was he reinstituted Passover. When you have all these distractions, we don't have time for the spiritual aspects of our life. So as he got rid of all the idols, all the priests, all the temples, all the stuff, now the nation had time for Passover again. The same for us. When we move, remove or deal with all the distractions we have, we'll have time for spiritual growth again in our lives. So what spiritual activities have you left aside? Bible reading, prayer, Christian fellowship? What needs to be reinstituted so you can know the truth and the truth can set you free? Matthew 21, 42, Jesus, speaking to the chief priests and the Pharisees, asked the question. He said, did you never read in the scriptures? I don't know what it would be like to get to the pearly gates, have you be greeted and say, how'd you like my book? And you say, I, I'm sorry, I just never had time to read it. Did you never read in the scriptures? Josiah read the word of God. He got a biblical perspective. It changed his life. Is the word of God changing your life? Because he became tender, he humbled himself before God. And in the midst of all the calamity around him, God blessed him. Can he do that for us today? And all the calamity that's going on in our world today, all the stuff that distracts us. Can we set it aside? Can we be the chosen people of God? And can he bless us even in the calamity? Go back to Exodus. When the plagues were going on, where was the nation of Israel? They were in Goshen. There were no frogs. There was no hail. There was no plagues in Goshen. God can take care of his people even in the calamities around us, if we're willing to humble ourselves, tender, tender-hearted, and give our attention back to God. So let's go back to the passage we started with. It may be up on the screen. 2 Kings 22, 18 through 20. We're going to close with this, where we started. But for the king of Judah, Josiah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, in this manner you shall speak to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which you have heard, because your heart was tender, and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse, and you tore your clothes and wept before me, I have heard you, says the Lord. Surely, therefore, I will gather you to your fathers and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace and your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I will bring on this place. Like Josiah, turn to the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Rediscover the truth of God's word as you read the scriptures. It will set you free. So our question this morning is, will we be hearers of the word or doers of the word? Will you accept the challenge to find truth again in your own life? I invite you to read with me every day. I've done it for my whole life. Will you seek and find? Will you knock and see if God will open his truth to you? Remember at the end of the passage, when Josiah heard this, he stood at a pillar and he made a covenant to God that said, I'm going to do what you say. And that's what I'm going to ask you. We're going to pray. And I'd like to know if you can stand with Josiah, stand with Scott, your pastor, stand with the team here and say, I can do this. I can seek the truth in my life each and every day. Enough with the excuses. It's time to make a change. And can you stand at the pillar with Josiah and the leaders of your church and make that commitment? What do you think would happen if everybody in this church read the Bible every day? 
What do you think would happen in the community if people start reading the Bible again? What do you think would happen to our nation, the world, if people got back to the Word of God, the truth of God's Word? So think about it as I pray. You make a commitment to the Lord, not to me, and uh, then we'll close. Father, we bow our hearts before you. We thank you that you love us so much that you gave us your word. You gave us an owner's manual because you created each one of us in your image. And then you gave us a book that could help us how to teach us how to live this thing called life. Lord, we, some of us ask for forgiveness for not spending enough time in your word. We can change that today and say, yes, Lord, I will make time to spend time with you each and every day. Teach me in your word. And Holy Spirit, we know it's your job to lead us into all truth. And we need to be taught your word. So Holy Spirit, as we spend time with you each day, teach us the truths of your, of your word. Help us change our lives according to your word because the truth can set us free. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen.